you from last week, we started on definitions. Uh, and we went through just a lot of verses. Um, the issues being whether when we say Jew, we're talking about Israel, or if we say Israel, are we talking about all the Jews? And the answer was, it depends upon the context. Uh, in, in the context of uh, salvation, what we're talking about are believing Jews. And in the context of politics, culture, na uh, nation, we're talking about all of Israel, uh, who aren't even necessarily physically Jews, physically descended from Abraham. Uh, it's been pointed out that Caleb, uh, one of the heroes of the faith, you should see the other guy. Uh, it's pointed out that Caleb was not even Jewish. Caleb was a Kenizzite. He was but he was adopted into the uh, into the Israelite culture, uh, which was uh, when the Israelites left Egypt. They came out with Egyptians, you know, people who, as long as they were circumcised and subscribed to uh, uh, the laws of Israel, were considered to be as one of the Israelites. So there's a, there's a this false notion that physical uh, descendants of Abraham are the only true Israel, which of course that's not the case. Uh, but we, we wanted to make the distinction and we did last week uh, that Jews and Israel, depends upon the context, we have a remnant believing Israel and then we have Israel as a political, cultural uh, entity. The same is true with Gentiles. Gentiles uh, so sometimes uh, oftentimes, are we playing with the uh, chords? Okay. All right, we're better now. <laughs> um, Gentiles, depending upon the context, are unbelievers or believers. It can, be, it can be either. So we have Jews and Gentiles. We have believers and not believers. Well, the believers are the church. The believers are the believers. There's a remnant from the Gentiles. There's a remnant from the Jews. Uh, any believer is, is uh, the church. And that's where we kind of left off. We were defining the church. Uh, that remnant Israel is believing Israel. Remnant Gentiles are believing Gentiles. Believers are believers. Uh, the church doesn't supersede uh, Israel. This idea of remnant theology, or, or remnant or replacement theology, that is, uh, is just a straw man that's set up to, uh, as a pejorative by those who really want to maintain a separateness between Israel and the church. Uh, so it's not replacement. We have here in Corinthians, we're talking, uh, or, or uh, Paul is talking, and we're, we're going to be here in just a few weeks uh, in, uh, in our sermon series, where Paul is saying, give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved. Talking about Jews, maybe that, that anybody could be saved. Jews, Greeks, and the church, uh, with the, into the church of God. So, this is kind of where we left off, uh, and we wanted to get to the, uh, the olive tree, the metaphor of the olive tree. So, uh, just going to read through this first, and then we'll discuss this uh, a little bit, because a lot of people get hung up here. This, of course, from Romans 11, uh, 16 to 24. If the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is also. And if the root is holy, the branches are too. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them, and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember, it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will then say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, and, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. 
And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? As I said, a lot of people get hung up here, again, with the separation, between, or trying to maintain a separation between Israel and the church. The main question that we have to answer is who or what is the root of that olive tree? Is it Abraham or Jesus? If the root makes the branches holy, which is what the passage said, then the root can't be Abraham. Only Christ is Messiah could be a person or the root that makes the branches holy. And so, don't make that mistake. We have to support here in Romans 9.3, when Paul was speaking uh, that he could wish himself a curse, separated or cut off, it's the same word, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. So here Paul is, is uh, saying that I mean, he's using the same cut off metaphor earlier in Romans so it, it, in support of this idea that it's the, the Jews who are being cut off um, from the Christ, that Christ is the root. So uh, really doesn't seem very arguable that Abraham could be the root of, of the olive tree. And then we have the, the question of who or what is the wild olive. Well, here Paul is uh, speaking to the Corinthians Gentiles, and, uh, and uh, not the Corinthians, the Romans, so he's talking to Roman believers, but only believers. So. Gentile believers can be grafted into the same cultivated tree, the natural olive tree, which is what were the natural olive tree. Well, if it's holy, because it, the root is holy, it has to be remnant of Israel, but not all of Israel, because they're holy. They can't be all of Israel. So, um, we have the context of Romans 9.6. It's not as though the word of God has failed, for they're not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So here we have the, uh, the branches being broken off. Romans 9.27, uh, where Paul says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. Again, this idea of it's not all of Israel. It can't be just racial Israel or, or national Israel. And in Romans 11, 7, what then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained it. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. So we can't have a singular Israel more and more support for this idea of a remnant and uh, a believing remnant. And the, and the remainder. So, there is <clears throat> most of the metaphor of the olive tree. What we have here in uh, Ephesians 3, 6, and uh, we have it saying, to be specific, the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. So, <clears throat> so you have here this idea that the tree is both remnant Israel, and the remnant of the Gentiles. It's believers who are the olive tree. And that's, and that's it. It's, some are physically Jews, some are physically Gentiles, but we're all spiritually Jews because we're grafted into the cultivated tree. We talked about how we are Jews last week. Uh, we, we had gone over that in those definitions. Now, <clears throat> It can be argued, and it is argued, that Paul is still only dealing with uh, remnant Israel in this passage of uh, the olive tree. Because he doesn't mention the church or the assembly uh, of, of God uh, until Romans 16, and here we are in Romans 11. 
uh, that the context of the, this olive tree metaphor is only Israel. It's their own olive tree, as it says in verse 24. But in the, just the very next chapter, in chapter 12, Paul goes on to use a different metaphor. He uses the human body metaphor. And he's talking about the same group of people because it's the content, broad context of what he's talking about, the believers of the church. Who is the church? It, it must be. And in Romans 12, 4, 5, he says, just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are the many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. <clears throat> and so and then this next verse, in 1 uh, Corinthians 12, 12 and 14, He's referring to that same body metaphor, and he makes it very clear that it's both Jews and Greeks. Um, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For Christ, the body, Christ, the body, the Christ's body is the church. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and we were all made to drink with one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. So, uh, while you might try to make the argument that the olive tree metaphor is, is still only dealing with Israel, and we're trying to maintain that separateness, he kind of he explodes that by going on in Romans 12, and then later in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, to he explodes that into no, it's all of the believers. It's not just it's not just Israel. So that pretty much I think cleans off the olive tree metaphor where, where so many people have so much trouble. Uh, so a couple more questions then: uh, Is the church new or is the church not new? The new it is new because uh, it's the, it's the new covenant. Christ is building a spiritual assembly, ecclesia, on his atonement and resurrection. He, he is leading the church out of the world spiritually, uh, not necessarily politically, which is what the, the, the Jews were looking for. It was a, a political solution. They were looking to get rid of the Romans. And, and, to, and, they, and the Jews see the, uh, all the Old Testament promises that we look at is that they will rule over the Gentiles. And that's what they were looking for, is a Messiah that would bring them into power. Uh, but Christ is actually building a spiritual assembly on his atonement and resurrection. Uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is new. Uh, the nations outside of Israel are no longer deceived, but now they have the Word of God. And, uh, and the Gospel goes forth without, uh, without as much hindrance uh, the gospel spreading, the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31, where God promised to put a new heart in us, a heart of flesh in Ezekiel, and then he was going to write on that heart of flesh, he was going to write his word, he's going to write his law, and that's going forth now. Uh, the mystery of the Gentiles receiving the Spirit, being grafted into the remnant, is also revealed. So the, the church is new, but it's also not new. Uh, from Acts 3, uh, we have uh, Peter saying, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed the prophet shall be utterly destroyed, cut off, that is, cut off from among the people. So, it's always been envisioned. People say, No, the church has never looked for in the, in the Old Testament, but clearly, uh, here it was, Moses saying, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Well, who is he talking about? The Christ there. And uh, so in a sense, it's not new. We had the church. We had Moses as mediator in the Old Testament. Moses was the mediator. That he got in trouble. We just heard, but we heard about it this morning in the sermon. As mediator... His job was to stand in front of the congregation of Israel and say, the Lord will bring forth the water. Instead, he strikes the rock in, in anger and says, must we bring forth water for you? Uh, and he forgot his role as mediator, so he was punished for that. But he was the mediator, just as now. It, 
We have the superior mediator. We have Christ who mediates between man and God. Uh, we also have the New Jerusalem that's often talked about, especially in, in Revelation. We hear about the New Jerusalem uh, is evidence that the remnant Israel is part of the church. We're using, we're using all these Jewish terms uh, to refer to the church as it, uh, as it grows. Uh, we have the gates of the New Jerusalem being named for the 12 tribes, more evidence that Christ himself, of course, was Jewish. He was an Israelite. And so, and so we have, just like, just like in the movies, little girls and dogs just steal the show. Uh, so we have a lot of evidence. Uh, it, it, it all kind of fits hand in glove. All the terminology, the Jewishness of, of who we are, not everyone who is descended from Abraham is a Jew, but we, we are the Jews because we've been grafted. So, ultimately, the confusion ends up in our misconceptions, in our misunderstandings of definitions on whether the church and Israel are the same. We can't make these mistakes. We can't make a mistake that it, we can't equate Israel with the Jews or the Jews with Israel. We can't. We have to read in context. We have to understand about the remnant believers. We can't make a mistake that the church is Gentile, so that Gentiles make up the church. The church is made up of believers, and as believers, we are spiritually Jewish. That's just the way it is. It's the way the Bible presents it. We can't make the mistake that national Israel is the same thing as spiritual or believing Israel. We must make the distinction. We always have to read for context. And, and again, I encourage you when you're reading now, especially in Romans 9 through 11 or 9 through 12, uh, read it with these definitions now in mind and see if it doesn't just kind of fall into place for you. Uh, we can't make the mistake that Gentiles have replaced Jews in the kingdom of God. It's not the case. Believers are the kingdom of God. And, and that's it. It's not a matter of replacement. The Jews, the believing Jews, the ones through whom the word came, were the only believers. There, there were no there were no believers on the islands. The islands had their arms out waiting for the law of God, waiting for the word. They, they don't, as, as, the, as the psalm said, they didn't know. They didn't know. Uh, but never make the mistake of, of this replacement. Uh, don't believe either that all the Jews have been hardened, and this we'll be getting into either next week or the week after that, uh, depending on how far we get here today. Uh, not all the Jews have been hardened. We can't be. We can't sit back and be arrogant, as, as Paul said. That the branches were broken off, and that's it. It's done. It's over uh, for the Jews. May it never be, said Paul. And we'll get to that. Those Jews can be grafted back in, and there is there is yet in, in Scripture. A, an enormous prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled about the ingrafting and the inbringing of the Jews. The physical racial Jews, not necessarily as a national entity, but as, uh, as uh, the uh, seed of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham. And never make the mistake that God can't graft those Jews back into the olive tree. So, these, if you keep these six things in mind, and it's really just those simple definitions that we we're talking about. Jews are not Israel. Gentiles are not the church. That the church is believers. If you keep those things in mind, it will keep you, uh, it'll keep it simple for you as you go through Romans and, uh, and, and all the scriptures and understand where the church is. As, as Joel pointed out, in his sermon today, the commentators, uh, the group of commentators, didn't make a distinction. There's no, the, the word in the Septuagint, ecclesia, when the, when the Old Testament was translated into the Greek, uh, the assembly, the congregation, the word ecclesia is what the word is for church. Uh, it's very interesting to me that as I was studying this, the word when, when Tyndale began his translation of the, uh, of the uh, Bible into English, he translated the word ecclesia 
not into the word church. He used the word congregation and used the word assembly. And got into a great deal of trouble. Of course, he ended up losing his life over the translation. Um, but the political powers of England much, much preferred the word church over assembly because the word church brings with it the implication of an institution, the implication of a hierarchy of bishops and monsignors and all those things that came along with it. Well, of course, the political powers of England want to maintain that hierarchy themselves. And so for power purposes, they prefer the word church. But the word is ecclesia. The assembly in the Old Testament and the assembly in the New Testament are the same assembly as believers. So with that, we, we kind of wrap up uh, the, the teaching part of, of this now, I have a lot of slides here uh, in the corner of, we'll, we'll, we'll start to go through these. Uh, I have a lot of slides from a little, I took these verses, this, this booklet, it's called The Church is Israel Now. It's, it's a very interesting uh, book. The, the subtitle is The Transfer of Conditional Privilege. Conditional Privilege. Uh, as we've argued, the, the covenants and the promises made to Old Testament Israel uh, were indeed uh, conditional. They were not unconditional. And uh, what Charles Proven did is he took uh, a lot of, uh, he just went through the Bible, he dug out the promises, then he dug out where the promise was abrogated, and, and then he showed us how it was applied to the New Testament church. So I have, I didn't put everyone in because it's, it's just filled with it, um, but I took some of the uh, some of the best of it, and and this is what we're uh, here. She comes again, and we uh, we put them up here. So here we have uh, what he put under the heading "Beloved of God" in Exodus 15:13. Your loving kindness, in your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation that Israel was beloved of God. In Jeremiah 16.5, For thus says, says the Lord, Do not enter a house of mourning, or go to lament, or to console them, for I have withdrawn my peace from this people, declares the Lord, my loving kindness and compassion. So there was the promise of uh, these people were his beloved. Now he's saying, no. And then in Romans 9.25, as, as Paul writes, as he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, my beloved. So the promises of the beloved people are now applied to the church. In this case, people would have read that as not my people, but now they're my people as the Gentiles. But it's, it's being applied to believers in this case. And uh, the children of God in Exodus 4.22 Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So God is declaring that the Israelites are his children. Deuteronomy 32.5 They have acted corruptly toward him. They are not his children because of their defect, but are perverse and crooked generation. So he's saying eh, it was conditional. They, they're not obeying. It's not a con unconditional forever and ever. And in John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So the children of God were the Israelites. <clears throat> it was the original promise, but if they acted corruptly toward him and don't receive him, not so much. But in John, it's being applied to any believer. Those who as many as receive him. The flock of God in Psalm 78, 52. We didn't get to that point today, but uh, but he led forth his own people like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. In John 10, 14, of course, we have, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. So, the, it's the same idea, except that it's his own. It's the elect. It's those who are the believers. 
um, we have here the kingdom of God in Exodus 9, or 19, 5 and 6. Uh, then, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. <laughs> In Matthew 8, 11, and 12, very familiar verse, verses, I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's talk about the breaking off branches. Here we have it. The sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness, the natural branches, the ones through whom the word came. And in Colossians 1.13, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, again being applied to the church. The people of God. Exodus 6 7. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And Hosea, and the Lord said, Now uh, name him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. He, he pulled it there as, as to an unfaithful and perverse uh, generation. But in 2 Corinthians 6 16, on what uh, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We have it applied in the New Testament to the believers, to the church, are the people of God, not just Israel. Hey, can I? Please. So this, when you lay this out, it's so clear. But on Facebook, <laughs> there is a current um, Stand with Israel theme. I mean, they're practically <coughs> waving their flag. And, yeah, it has gone on for years. But I feel like there's a resurgence. Because just with Netanyahu being before Congress and all that stuff, that we're, we're seeing more of that. So, why do we believe... Exodus 6, not me, but the people who would stand with Israel, and not Hosea 9. What, how do they stand on that, and what would our argument, I mean, obviously our argument's there, but what are they standing on to say nothing's changed, and, you know, God has favored Israel, and it's only Israel? I, I just, I don't know. Do you hear my question? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, how do we respond? How do we respond? I think the only thing we do is respond with, with Scripture and say, but that's... What do you do with this verse? What do you do with this verse? And, and what do you do with this verse? And what do you do with this verse? I don't know, uh, except that it's been teaching. It's been taught that way. And and, um, and it's a very nice and, and neat system of, of believing. It, it, answers, it answers questions that relate to personal piety and personal salvation. is to do these things, to believe these, this way, has much to do with how your salvation is going to be worked out. And so we've talked many times about how personal piety is the scourge of the church, is that what we're worried about is only our salvation, and the salvation of others, but individuals, and not seek ye first the kingdom of God. We're, if we're only seeking our own salvation, it's a part of seeking the kingdom of God, but it's not the end. It's not the end of what we're supposed to be hanging on, but that's what people are. So it's a, I think it's a very selfish thing to say, okay, I'm just worried about me. And this system of belief that... Uh, I'm going to be saved and I'm going to be removed from all troubles so that Christ can return, rule with the Israelites over the nations. Is It's a simple system. And it, and it relieves us of having to get our hands dirty in, in seeking the kingdom of God, in building the kingdom of God. And uh, So people are taking that as just get into the kingdom of God. 
Just get in. And not build the kingdom of God. Exactly. Because Christ is going to build the kingdom. We're not going to have to do it. Christ is going to. We don't have to fight fights. Christ is going to fight fight. It, it, you know, it's a, in a sense, there's a, oh, there's a, a it's almost socialistic. You know, I get the, I get the benefits, but I don't have to, you know, we socialize in, in today's world. If a bank loses money, we socialize that risk. And then the government pays the bank. But if the bank makes money, they get to keep it. Well, it's the same kind of socialism where, I, you know, I get my salvation, but I don't, have, I don't have to fight. I don't have to fight for it. It's something that's been handed to me. So, it's the way I, I have to fight. I've been, the way Elizabeth has the abortion thing, the dispensationalism is my thing. I've been, been going back and forth with this for years with people close to me, associated, whatever. And I can sound harsh, sorry. But it's almost like voodoo to me. It's like, and the idea that Jewish, national Jews, that you have to bless them. If you don't, that's where everybody I encounter is hung up. If you don't bless these as a people group, God's going to curse you. And it's like, if you can get, tear that down, that, that, that does a lot. But tearing that down is hard. And, and it's like, I have people in my life that tell me if I have a bad day, it's because I don't support national Israel. It's crazy. I mean, it really is a, a, like a voodoo type of thing, that if you act this way, towards this nation and these people, you will be blessed. Yeah. When God said that, I will bless them and bless them and curse them and curse them, he was talking to Abraham. He was talking to Abraham, right. Period. I, unless, and we I mean, are the seed It took me a long time to get there because of all this extraneous teaching. Israel, right or wrong, you know, it's Israel, it's Israel, you know, like, right. hey, yeah. You know, and um, but and Israel you know, has he was talking to the Lord was talking to Abraham. Yes. He was about to go out. He didn't even know where he was going. Yeah. And we are the seed of Abraham. Correct. And so we inherit that promise as the seed of Abraham, Abraham not necessarily <coughs> his physical descendants. Not necessarily national Israel. Right. Okay. Yeah, um, I had a conversation with a young lady this week who uh, double majored uh, in college and one of her double majors was Judaistic studies. And um, she agreed that uh, identifying Jews, real Jews, seed of Abraham, impossible. Well, yeah, that, can't, be, can't be done. We haven't even talked about that here in this class today to actually identify racial descendants, physical descendants of Abraham is merely impossible. Uh, most Jews in Israel today are Ashkenazi, which are, they're Caucasian, they're not even Semitic. Uh, to, be, to, to be accused of anti-Semitism is, is ridiculous because they're not even racially part of what was racially Israel. Those people have been scattered. Uh, and uh, it's potentially someday when DNA testing is, is, is as commonplace as, as aspirin, it may be possible. Uh, I, I suspect that, that will be the case, but not, but not now. We don't know. And, and the, the fact of the matter is that cultural and political Israel hates us. They hate Christ. Uh, they subscribe to, they're still looking for political salvation. They're still looking for God, horses and chariots. Um, and if they don't have to use their own, fine. If they have to use their own, that's fine too. Uh, but that's that's the case. They are not a spiritual nation. They are not a nation looking, even looking for a Messiah. Well, they're the Pharisees, right? I don't know what they are. And they're, they're, they're playing on Christian sympathies here. They're playing us for fools. You know, stand with, stand with Israel. One that I heard it was a too off topic, but one that I've heard so often is from someone I know quite well is, you know, he, they, we believe in granting and all this stuff, but as much as Israel was emphasized, God still has something extra special for them. He does down the road. He does, and we're going to talk about that. And it has it's it's in Romans uh, here in. Uh, we're going to get to this. 
very shortly, maybe even as soon as next week. It's in Romans 11. And I'm gonna, it starts. Uh, it's because of the Corinthians. It doesn't read right. Um, but it, it refers to a, a grafting back in. Uh, it, it's, it's, in the context, it refers to the grafting back in. But what it's talking about. 11.23. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this. If they do not continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to draft them in again. But then he goes on to say, um, <clears throat> this is. Paul gets so excited about this that we have one of the great benedictions and what doxologies of the Bible afterwards. Um, he says in 25, beginning of 25, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. What mystery was that? Well, he was talking about uh, whether or not the, Israel was completely hardened. I don't want you to be uninformed of this mystery, so you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. Partial hardening, read you, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers, of the fathers. Mm -hmm. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The calling of God, that's the election. Not all Israel is elect. There's a partial hardening that's going on of the individual Jews, of the individual Jew who subscribes to that faith. Uh, for just as you were once disobedient, uh, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they may now be shown mercy. For God shut up, has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. And so what, what's promised is that all Israel will be saved. What's promised, but there's going to be an enormous revival at some point in history when the Jews are going to be called to Christ in a massive, in a massive um, revival, so to speak, that it will be noticeable globally. People will see that these Jews are being grafted back in, and it will be uh, a wonderful time for us. Um, and, and then Paul goes on, to, he, he, this just blows him away. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments, and how unfathomable his ways. You know, he's, he's just, he's so thrilled, thrilled by it. Um, it's, uh, and we are going to study this uh, in, in some detail, because this was, this is the basis of this other book that I've been carrying around, called The Pure Hope, which I talk about all the time. This is, uh, this is a book that has changed my thinking so much on eschatology, kingdom thinking, is that book right there. Uh, Ian Murray just is, does a masterful job of what were the, what was the Puritan hope? Puritan hope was revival. It's happened over and over and over in history, and it's gonna happen. We still have one big revival to go that's been prophesied in, in, in there in Romans 11 that has not yet occurred. We have not yet seen that. And when it happens, it will spark an enormous time of flourishing for the church and for uh, the true religion of Christ uh, in, in time and history. We'll see the nations flowing unto God at that time. So we'll, we'll pick this up again and we'll try to get into more discussion next time um, before, we, before we get into that. And we'll try to kind of pound this, pound this out uh, before, we, before, we, before we do that. So, are there any questions now that we... What was the name of that first book you said? The first book is it's called The Church is Israel Now. Um, what was this, about eight bucks on uh, Kelsey? 
that it was causing the EDU. Yeah. Or was that uh, no, that was, that was others. Um, it's only about 60 pages, and uh, and it's 90% scripture. He just lays it out. We're going to be uh, ordering more stuff from them for Mars. If you think I should get, you might get a handful, okay. I guess a couple, because uh, yeah, I like that idea. To have on the table, because okay. even even if people don't buy it, it'll spark a discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Real quick, I do think, I don't think anybody here will do it, but I think some people that revival the Jewish people spark some, or many, unfortunately, I think we're outnumbered in the Christian community, to think that the church is going to be taken out of the way, that's what will cause that to happen. <coughs> you know, but, yes, there's also a great deal of, there's also a great deal of thought that says that can only happen at the end of history because of the, this idea that the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Uh, that that can only happen after the last Gentile has been converted, and then the Jews will be converted, or they perhaps even Christ comes back to convert the Jews. It, it, I don't know. It, it, we'll talk about that. Uh, Murray, uh, I think, per, pretty much demolishes that argument. Uh, and by, extra, by special, what I was saying is, I think the at least the people I know are saying there's something extra special about that. Specifically, yeah, you know, you've got, you know, we're mystical, we're, magical, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there's just something because of all these prophecies, there's just something extra, which you know, I understand them being great, you know, when they come back in, it's gonna be a great time for the church, but you would still think it still comes into one body, and it's not like some, these are extra special bodies, and, you know. We know somebody who firmly believes that by supporting Israel, uh, a special place. There's a special level of heaven reserved for those who support Israel. And celebrate the feasts. And celebrate, yeah, celebrate the feasts and keep all of the, all of the uh, Jewish customs. Special place in heaven. Mm -hmm. That's right. What verse is that? Closer to God. Be closer to God. That's what she told She believes we'll be there. Yeah, we, we get to heaven too. But we're. You know, so, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's almost very similar. Similar. <laughs> Yeah, we're first floor. Yeah. She's yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's there. There is. We know people. Uh, more than one person. Many people believe that there's something as, extra special, magical about the Jewish people. So it, I don't think it's supported by scripture. I just don't. I can't find it. So we should call ourselves Jews. Spiritually. I've heard two Christian people tell me that. that they're, Ray Comfort says he's Jew. I didn't know if he was to begin with. But. Yeah. Uh, you weren't here last week. No, I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, we got into this. Um, where it was, I believe, here in the Gentiles. Instead of Christian, we should say we're a Jew? No. What? No. Okay. Because Jewish... Uh, Paul says that we're when we're circumcised of heart that we're, that we're Jewish. That's when we're that's when we're Jewish. But there, are, I'll, I'll dig up the scriptures here and just see me afterwards. Well, are these posted on YouTube? These videos? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they may be, and I'd be happy. To I will I'll e to read and watch it. I'll, be, I'll, I'll email you the uh, the PowerPoint. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What's the new ones? Yeah. Okay. Did you? People are wondering what we're doing is 12, 10. <laughs> it, it, it can almost seem like du double speak. Uh, in, in some respects, the, the Jews do have uh, a disproportionate uh, I, I guess disproportionate as to election, perhaps. Uh, by, the, by what we read in Romans 11, uh, you know, in the 20, 25, 26, 27, in that general range. Uh, and um, I, so, so, there, so, it, so it is that you know, God is honoring uh, he his, is. His, 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 his favor towards them in the beginning. Because he, he's yet coming back around again, 
and, uh, yes. and, 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 and offering, offering them salvation. People at the time. Yes, it's not, he's not going to go back and save every Israelite. No, 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 no. no. I mean, but yes. In, in the future. In the future. future. Right. Yes. As the gospel spreads, it will spread more and more. It'll get bigger and bigger. It's, it's kind of like a, you get a critical mass and things really start to, to, to show. People who are born into covenant households have a much better chance of being saved because they hear the gospel from the time they're little. Uh, I've had people argue to me that uh, it doesn't seem fair that, not fair, it doesn't seem that God is consistent, that as the world becomes more and more Christianized, that people will have more and more of a chance, quote unquote, chance, to become Christians because they hear the gospel, as opposed to many, many years past when they didn't hear the gospel. But that also supposes that it's an all chance. But God holds every moment and every atom in his hand. And so if this is his plan as he works things out over time, then that's his plan. It's no more chance that you were born in the year 2500 than it was chance that you were born in the year 1900 or 900. And so if you're born into a more Christianized world in a better, more peaceful, more prosperous place, well, that was God's choice as well. But God does have a special place in his heart for the people, Israel, through whom he first brought the word, through whom he brought the Messiah. And yes, there is this promise in Romans that says those people will be rewarded, in a sense, by their, because of their heritage, because of his election. Okay, and, and is that not special? It is special. Right. But that doesn't make them any more special than any other Christian as far as how we should treat them. We treat all people, we should treat all people with with respect. We should love all our neighbors, believer or unbeliever, and try to bring them to Christ. And the fact that we can if we, if we can witness to Jews, or if we can witness to our neighbor Gentile neighbors, well fine, we should. But uh, how God will work in, in time and in history is laid out in, in the Bible. He has in mind his kingdom. See, first, that's what we were talking about. That's what he has in mind. And he has Christ sitting at his right hand until all his enemies, his, Christ's enemies, are made his footstool. So, part of making his enemies his footstool is the conversion of the Jews. It is the conversion of many, many more. All the nations will, will flow. People will say, come, let us go up to the house of, of God of Jacob. Right? Let's learn about his law. It's going to be a very exciting thing. It's going to be a very winsome thing. People will get really excited about learning about the law. And they won't have to teach anybody else because everybody wants, everybody is, is learning and it's going to be written on our hearts and we're going to go, go up and, and seek it out. But, the, but as for the as for the Jews, if they are, they still do have a, a place in prophetic history, as we'll see. Um, it's just that we don't need to idolize them. Right. That's, right. And that's where we get into this idea of, well, if I curse a Jew, I'm like, I only go to get the first floor in heaven. You know. the, the Bible actually says the Jews, people who call themselves Jews who are not Jews are actually in the synagogue of Satan. Yes. So it's like, that's pretty harsh. And so it, there's just maybe a special time where they're going to be, their hearts will be unheartened, but it's a, the, until then, it's just the opposite. I mean, yes. how many are dying in the, in the synagogue of Satan until that happens? You know, well, a Jew or Gentile who deny the Lord. They have the same fate reserved. John, just one last thing about cursing Jews. Paul, Paul laid the most serious curses on Jews of anyone. Maybe Paul, except for Christ. Christ. But what he said, <laughs> whoever doesn't love Christ, let him be in that. And, and twice in, in Galatians, anybody who preaches different gospels, talk about Jews, let them be in that. Let them be cursed. Paul cursed Jews. 
should, should end the discussion. Okay, it doesn't. But should. Well, if only got to the first floor in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> the basement. Yeah. That's right. Better be a gatekeeper in the house of, at the house of the Lord than outside. We better pray and uh, wrap this. Father, we